Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Big East Rewind. My name's Chuck Everson. I'm your host and my co-host, as always, <laughs> my point guard, number 23 in your program, number one in your heart, the sensational <laughs> Sonny Sparrow from Syracuse University, ladies and gentlemen. How are you, Sonny? Chuck, I'm doing great. We got another Orangeman in the house today. None of these Wildcats. I know. That's, good. that's, that's great. Good. You know, you know what's amazing, Sonny, is all of these guys that we've had in the media that have come out, you know, 90% of them are from Syracuse. What a great program um, that the university has when it comes to turning out folks uh, that get in front of the camera and, and, and do interviews and do play-by-play -play and things like that. It's really, it's really unbelievable. What a, great, what a great program from that university, huh? Yeah, Newhouse School is pretty tremendous. And um, yeah. we have put some really some of the best that's ever done it out there. So and today, really I, think, I think we have one that fits in that category today. Well, yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I'm going to introduce our guest. Um, as you said, he's from Syracuse University. And uh, in, in, listen, Sonny, back when I was a kid and growing up, my favorite news channel was Live at Five on Channel 4. And this guy was a huge, huge part of that with Chuck Scarborough and Sue Simmons and mm -hmm. Al Roker. Uh, he was the sports guy there for a while. You might know him from Spanning the World. He was the also the original play-by-play -play guy, the original voice of the Big East Conference. Yes, indeed. And he's done, he's done numerous different things. And currently, you can catch him with uh, Michael Rito and the Len Berman and Michael Rito in the morning on 710 WOR Radio in New York City. The great Len Berman is joining us today. Len, thanks so much for joining the show. So I heard you guys referencing all the announcers who came out of Syracuse. And a lot of us did. So I'm often asked at Syracuse alumni gatherings, what's the reason so many of you guys uh, went to Syracuse? And I said, a very easy explanation is that none of us could get into Cordell. So there you go. <laughs> I'm surprised the next question was, oh, and by the way, we'd like a donation. <laughs> oh, I've gotten that. Don't worry about that. No, I got a yeah. lot of those. Yeah. They don't miss an opportunity. <laughs> no, I know. So, so Sonny and Sonny and I, that's where we met actually in Syracuse land. I, I, Sonny was my host on my visit. Okay. And, Chuck, uh, he, can he I did say one, th can I say one thing? Sure. I, this Raftery did this and it drove me nuts. Repeat after me. Syracuse. Not Syracuse. Syracuse, not like Aunt Sarah. Seer. Syracuse. Okay. <laughs> He's okay. the Philadelphia guy, Sonny. I, I you know, know language. And, and a Long Mexico Island guy, too. It's my to Long Island accent. Like, Thank you. you know? Thank you, Len. Right. You see Syracuse. what I work with? You see what my, I'm working no, with? No, my condolences, Sonny. I mean, really. <laughs> All right. Listen. Hey, we're classing I, up the joint. <laughs> anytime I can get lessons from you, Len, you know, in doing this stuff, I'm oh, way cool. ahead of the game, man. That's okay. awesome. Okay. So, so let me hear you say we, we met at Syracuse. There you there you was that so hard? Very easy. I, I'm a quick learner, Len. That's very good. <laughs> so that's where Sonny and I met was at Syracuse. Right. And uh I was uh, a visitor and he was my host. Really? He did such a good job that I turned around and signed with that little Italian guy at Villanova. Uh, Raleigh was the best. Going there. You know, one of my favorite experiences, and, you know, it was because of Raftery. We went and did a game at Villanova, and Raleigh says, uh, come over to the house after the game. And I was like, what? You know, it's sportscasters, you know, you go back to the hotel and have a drink in the bar and go to sleep. Raleigh, we went over to his house and had pizza. And it was just, he was the best. I, Raleigh was the, I was so happy when you guys won the championship in 85. I actually wrote him a handwritten note. I said, Raleigh, that's the best. Congratulations. And he wrote back. I mean, he, I, I loved Raleigh. And, you know, that was the, that was the thing about the Big East. Think of those coaches. I mean, my goodness. You know, Bayheim's still there, for God's sakes. I mean, yeah. uh, Louis and, of course, uh, John Thompson and uh, Raleigh and, I mean, those were the big yeah, when the biggies first began those were the big four yep yep i agree yep. so so you jumped into the biggies let's start yeah. there len how did how did you get involved with being the uh the commentator on yeah. on the biggies games early in the because yeah. we had mike trangisi on and mike uh -huh. was telling us how he got the contract which was an amazing story in itself you know that might have been right when you kind of get started right at that point well, the Big East uh, began in the 1979-80 season. I had been a sportscaster in Boston for uh, five years in the 70s. <clears throat> and then right before the Big East came into existence, 
uh, we did an HBO Game of the Week in college basketball. I know it sounds crazy now, but it was an HBO Game of the Week. Uh, Marty Glickman, another Syracuse alum. Oh, wow. Right, yeah. Week. Yeah. Marty was working at HBO as a consultant. He put this whole thing together. This is the year before ESPN began. And he put together an HBO Game of the Week. And Marty hired me and Tommy Heinsohn. We went around the country. Very first game was Magic Johnson and Michigan State against the Russians. Uh, later in the season, we went to Indiana State and did a Larry Bird game. So, you know, uh, Marty obviously knew what was going on in college basketball, who the, who the big stars were. And we did a game of the week. Now, then um, I was working as a weekend sportscaster in New York on WCBS is before I went to WNBC. And so I think Trangisi and Gavitt decide, Dave Gavitt, of course, uh, they decided that uh, they wanted to have somebody who had an identification with a couple of the cities. And I'd also gone to Syracuse, but I was working in New York. I'd worked in Boston. They thought I had some of the Big East covered. And I'll never forget, he called me up, Mike Trangisi, uh, who I think I knew. I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I knew Mike from Providence days. Uh, mm -hmm. And I remember I, I saved it. The, I actually typed Big East. He said, we're going to do this thing called the Big East. And I said, well, what kind of a name? To myself, what kind of a name is that? I'd heard yeah. of the Big Ten, you know, the Big Eight, the Pac-10. Big East, it didn't roll off the tongue. And I wrote it as one word, Big B I G E A. I I said, this is, this I, sounds good. You know, I could use the money. I'll do a couple of games. But Big East, and they, these two were the best. I mean, um, at first, Dave Gavitt was my co-anchor. Uh, he was the, uh, the analyst. Yeah. And he got yeah. some crap in the New York papers. He's a commissioner doing his own games. But, you know, Dave was a great analyst. And, and he really, he was great to analyze the game. You know, the, you know, the newspaper guys want the dirt and, they want, and they're afraid that he won't be honest. But he was a great analyst. And he, and he also did uh, games for the NCAA on radio. And, yeah. and he knew what he was talking about. So when we did the games, it was great. And then, of course, Raftery came along a couple of seasons later when he realized he wasn't going to be coach of the year at mm -hmm. C. Hall. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and he was just a hoot. I mean, he was just fun to, and we had a great time. But that that's how it began. Trangisi called me up. And to show you how how ragged we were as an organization, he said, we're going to do a Monday night game of the week. I said, okay, so that sounds good to me. The very first Monday night game of the week was on a Wednesday. And it was uh, <laughs> Seton Hall hosting Princeton. Uh, so, you know, obviously Princeton's in a different league yeah. in many ways. Uh, and so that's how it all began. I remember we finished the broadcast and, and, and the guy, I guess, in charge of the arena turned the lights out. So there, there we were standing and doing our closing comments and the light <laughs> went out at, at Walsh gym. At Walsh gym, Hall. yeah. <laughs> it, was just, it was nutty. I mean, it was just, that was the beginning. But out of that, I mean, oh, come on. We had Ewing and Mullen and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Pearl and, and Pinkney and John yeah. Pinone and, uh, come on, it was the, it was the, and the best part was those guys were in the, were in the big, uh, were in college for four years. Right. Yeah. So we had that St. John's, you know, Chris Mullins and, uh, and, um, and Patrick Ewing, they went head to head twice. Well, four times in 85, but twice, right. twice a year, you know, every year it was great. The rivalries were incredible. That's why uh, it was just so special. And to come in at that time, I mean, think of those players. I mean, it was right. unbelievable. In the first years of the Big East. So we had great, every Monday night was a different game, a different war. It was Syracuse St. John's, it was Syracuse Georgetown. And it was just, you know, take your pick. It was Villanova, Syracuse, Villanova, George. I mean, it was great. It was great stuff. It's funny you mentioned that about Dave Gavitt, because I think Bill Raftery's the same way. He's he's not going to give, you know, any dirt or big story. He's going to call the game. He's going to analyze the game. He's complimentary. As a player, we loved Raft. We still love Raft. I mean, yeah. just – he just was he was he was a coach's he was a coach's coach. He wasn't trying to make a story out of something that right. was going to promote himself, you know. And that right. was really that he was, was just fun. a fun loving guy. What was his line? Send it home, Jerome, or something. Send it, send send it, it in, in, Jerome. Yeah, send it in, Jerome, for Pittsburgh. <laughs> uh, but he was. I remember. I I remember this. And I wish I could tell you more details, but I used to keep my own score on a score sheet, uh -huh. and then, uh, you know, points, foul, whatever. And um, so after a basket would be scored, uh, scored, I'd be looking down and putting in the two points or whatever to whoever scored. And uh, and all of a sudden the crowd goes nuts. And I'll never forget 
Now you'll, you'll only see this on the TV version, but Raftery just looked at me and went, he just pointed at two guys. And I knew that, uh, that Chris Mullen had intercepted the pass and dished it off maybe to Wennington. I don't know, but it was just such a symbiotic relationship that he just, I just knew what had happened based on Raftery just moving his head and pointing. It was, it was great. I mean, yeah. And when you get a partner like that, that you're so simpatico with, you know, that's got to make your life a lot easier, right? It was just fun. I mean, it was just uh, the hardest part was going to sleep after the game because, because he, <laughs> you know, Raftery he liked to, bar. he liked to turn back a few at the, and he'd run into the sports writers there. I remember, you know, running into Leslie Visser or whoever's writing for the various, uh, you know, she was writing for the Boston Globe at the time. You know, he, right. he would just, he would drink the night away. And I, that wasn't me, you know, I was, I'm a Jewish kid. I, you know, I have a drink and I'm ready to go to sleep. You know. <laughs> yep. What What are some of your What are some of your uh, favorite memories of some of those early games, when You know, the when uh, when the league got cu- that got started. Well, I just remember the the, the thirty thousand at Syracuse. I mean, it was just uh, I, one of my f- favorite memories is that. Uh, Syracuse and Georgetown are going like crazy. And just 30, every time we went there, it was a new on-campus attendance. Right, record. new on-campus yeah. record. New on-campus So anyway, we're doing this game. I don't know if you remember this game, Sonny. I don't know if you were in this game, but Syracuse and Georgetown go down to the wire, and this kid, Michael Jackson, hits like a shot, a jump shot from the foul line at the buzzer to win the game for Georgetown, and the place is like dead. Dead silent, silent. yeah. And, do you remember that? And so I remember going in the locker room, and I, and I remember we weren't really allowed at the Georgetown lot, but I guess he was in the vestibule. And uh, I'll never forget. I said to Michael Jackson, I didn't know the guy. I, I said, boy, uh, tell me about that shot. And I swear to God, he said, which one? And I just, I just, I just, I, just, I don't know. I give up. I don't know. I just, <laughs> my, other, my other favorite Georgetown story is that, um, I used to, t- I have two sons who weren't big sports fans. They're still not, but now they're grown and they do other things. But um, every, I would take each kid to a different game. So I remember taking one of my sons to a game in Pittsburgh. And I took one of my, my kid when he was nine years old, my son, Daniel, who's now an attorney. I took him to a Georgetown game at Landover, Maryland. Yep. The game's over and That's I'm standing funny. outside with Raftery because we weren't allowed in the locker room. You know, we weren't allowed to speak to the players at Georgetown, basically. Yep. So... <laughs> I remember standing outside the locker room and John Thompson walks over and grabs my son's hand and says, you want to come in the locker room? And I'm pissed. I mean, I wanted to go to the locker room. I, I, was never, I never got to talk to any of the Georgetown players. In or out. Anyway, so he takes my son, nine years old, comes out of the locker room and his eyes are the size of saucers. And he says, daddy, they have penises the size of fire hoses. And I... I just, I remember being upset on so many levels. I mean, sure. Thanks Thompson for knocking me down another peg in my son's eyes. But anyway, that, those well, were the days. Kind of hard for a follow-up question. No, I didn't, I, I didn't, know, if, I didn't know if we were still on the air. Actually, I've, actually I've, I've written, I, I wrote about that in my book and I actually told that story. Uh, well, I know I told it to Howard Stern who ate it up, but I mean, I, I forget who else I told it to. So I, I have to ask you a question. When you were a student at Syracuse, were you also broadcasting the games on WAER? Yes, yes. WAER. The, and, and here's the here's the kicker to that story. So my freshman year, I'm announcing this. My very first game I get to do is a Syracuse-St. John's game. In January, that would have been uh, 1980. Oh, okay. I don't know. You weren't there then, right? That was your freshman year? Yes. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Take that. Let me take that whole story back because I'm thinking of the Big East. My freshman year, I was a freshman in 64. This would have been January of 65. Okay. So my very first game at Manly Fieldhouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, you never you never played at Manly, did you? No. We, I started in the – I was the second year we were in the Dome. the Dome. They started in the Dome in 80. So, yeah. Well, Manly Fieldhouse was a place that had this dirt track. Yep. And you smelled like dirt when you left Manly Fieldhouse, whether you were a broadcaster, a fan, whatever. You just smelled like dirt. Um so this is, forgive me for getting the year wrong. This is January of 65. The very first game I ever announced is a Syracuse um, St. John's game on WAER radio. And playing in that game is Jim Behan. Jim Behan, yeah. And he's still there, that son of a, I'm telling you, he was a hell of a player. Now he and Dave Bing, of course, were, you know, Bing was the big star. 
Beheim was a hell of a player. I don't think you probably knew it uh, at, 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 on some level, but you know, people looked at him as being this gangly kind of looking guy, you know, but he was like a Phil Jackson type. I mean, you know, just didn't look the smoothest, but Beheim was a great player. There was a, an NCAA playoff game. I'm going to say 66. I'm sure the year is wrong because I'm screwing up all the dates on your show. Um, Syracuse is playing Duke. In those days, there weren't 32 or 64 teams. I don't know how many. There weren't that many teams. And Syracuse right. playing a really good Duke team. And Bing just has a bad game. And the irony was if they had won the game, Bing would have gone home to Washington, D.C. to play in the next round. Oh, Beheim wow. carried the team. Beheim carried the team offensively and defensively in that NCAA playoff game against Duke. Anyway, uh, so Beheim's still there. And he was in the first game I ever announced, which is crazy when you consider. I mean, that's how many 50-something years? He's yeah, there. amazing, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? He's true blue loyal. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, one of the things I cannot say enough positive things about how loyal he has been to the university, the community, everybody. So, what was uh, can I ask you what it was like to play for him? Because you could be, you could be honest. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, Raftery's line that on his tombstone he's going to have a picture of Bayheim looking like, hey, <laughs> what are you doing to me, refs? You know, that would be on his tombstone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to, to play play for coach it was it was difficult he was demanding but he was uh he, he was demanding but he was different like my high school coach was demanding but you kind of knew it he was i think coach Bam was a deeper thinker and didn't often let you into what he was thinking yeah. but I, I do think that he was a couple steps ahead of everybody including us and that was hard for me because i, I was more of a I'm not into metaphors and, you know, just tell me, tell me, I'll, I'll grasp it a little better. Yeah, so yeah. I do better with that, but all in all, I mean, his, you know, his success and the fact that he's loyal and he's, he's never held the school hostage. I think he's grossly underpaid as a coach. Yeah. And I, I really, really, the older I get, the way more that I truly admire all the things that he's done. Well, he's made such a great program. Here's the part I could never understand. He recruited all these kids from California to come play there. Yeah. And you can attest to the fact that your face will break in the cold in Syracuse, yeah. New York, in January or February. It's just the worst. The weather's the worst. The sun doesn't shine from October to April. It's And he somehow got those California kids to come. Uh, I, I I don't know how he did it, but it was amazing. <laughs> Well, you, he credits Pearl with that, but you, I, I remember Pearl when Pearl had his announcement with um, uh, Al McGuire, and it was broadcast nationally. Yeah, and he said, "I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to," and he said, "He said Syracuse." He used the wrong term, by the way. Pearl, he did. Uh, he said Syracuse. You know, rest in peace. Brooklyn kid said, can't say can't say Syracuse. Come on. Yeah, and and of course, uh, McGuire says, "You're going to go up so cold up there." I was like, "Come on, man, let's just let him go. Let him come up. We'll be good." <laughs> Pearl was I, what I loved watching about Pearl, and I know it, it, it sounds weird. I could see in his neck, it was a weird thing. He would be dribbling up the court, and I could just see his neck would either tense or turn a darker shade. And I knew he was going to turn it up a notch and just either take off, drive, let, whatever he did. Yeah, he was he was phenomenal. I mean, he was just uh, you know, yeah. he had gears that you only saw in games. You didn't see yeah. him in practice. Oh he yeah, said, you didn't practice. See him practice. Who said pra practice? Was yeah. he an Iverson type? He was. Yeah, he yeah. he was smart like that. He wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna waste extra energy in practice. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, he was. He killed us. I know that, especially up at the dome. We we had no shot if he was on the floor uh, was, playing up there. He was just tremendous. He was just such a. I I thought he'd be a great pro. It shows you what you just never know. I mean, you just never know about anything in sports. I thought he was just gonna be a, a phenomenal pro and it just, I, it just never happened you know yeah. what len i think the game came easy to him up until that point and then when he got yeah. there and everybody's as good as him then you know it changed a little bit for him i think maybe that's it maybe it was that lack of practice i don't, I don't yeah. know <laughs> maybe it caught up so we talked about coach Bayheim and 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 pearl and talk about some of the other characters uh that were coaches in the big east <laughs> at that time we had we had, we had a lot Louis, of and we had uh, Roley, and we had all these guys that were just charismatic characters on the yeah. sidelines. They well, were like uh, they were like rock stars. Everybody, you know, the yeah. camera. If something happened on the court, the camera always shot to the coach. Yeah. Well, you know, though, you had the famous Louis sweater, a great game against Georgetown at the Garden. It was the battle for them. that was one phenomenal night. Uh, that that's really 
kind of what put, put ESPN on the map. I mean, it sounds strange, but everyone didn't have ESPN in their homes. And right. anecdotally, it came back that people were lined up around bars in Florida and around the country to get in to watch the, the uh, uh, Georgetown uh, uh, St. John's game. Louis, and of course, uh, John Thompson comes out and he opens his shirt and uh, jacket. He's wearing a big sweat, Louis sweater. Louis was great. And just like Raleigh, he was just, he made you feel like family. I mean, I, I went to Syracuse. I never, ever, uh, I, I felt like I was a member of St. John's when I would go, you know, that's where I'm living now on Long Island. And, uh, and he would take us to the local, you know, watering hole Dante's and sit and have dinner with us. And yeah. it was just, uh, I really felt partial to that. And, and uh, just to sock it back to what your original question was, I just remembered a story that the Georgetown people thought I was rooting for Syracuse as an announcer. And Jake Krauthammel at Syracuse, who was the athletic director, he went in the Syracuse Herald uh, and told them that I was rooting for Georgetown. So I, I just, you know, I called up, I called Rav. I said, well, I think I'm doing a great job then because they <laughs> both think I'm rooting for the other guys. The other um, uh, John Thompson thing I found very interesting because that became a whole uh, Hoya paranoia thing. And you have to admit there was a touch of racism involved in all that. And, and of course, as a member of the media, I was like, ah, oh, Georgetown. And they wouldn't let us talk to the players. And I just remember after one game in Syracuse, I was waiting for a plane and John was there and we just sat next to each other and talked. And, and Thompson told me this whole thing. I said, well, why, you know, why, you know, I, I'd love to get to know your players as Pete or whatever. He says, he said, listen, um, um, they don't let the referees talk who are grown men and they don't let the referees talk to the media and talk to anybody. My kids are kids. I don't want them in an uncomfortable, you know what? And when I sat with them, it made perfect sense. Yeah. And that kind of took the edge off what he was thinking. I don't think uh, what he did was to be nasty or to be mean no. or that Hoya paranoia. I think he was just a protective father. You know, he had the famous yeah. story of the ball that didn't have the air sitting on his desk. And this is what your life is going to be like if you don't have basketball. I mean, and I, I kind of understood it, but I didn't like it any better at all, but I kind of, he kind of helped me understand what he was thinking. And I, I appreciated that. That's, a, that's something we've learned from talking with a lot of the players. You know, we've had a lot of the guys on and, Actually, the uh, the paranoia wall has come down big time after talking with a lot of these guys. They're just great guys. And I, I really think Thompson's method, there was a method to the madness. I really do think the yeah. father figure was something. I thought he thought of himself. I thought he protected him. I think yeah. the racism, like you said, I think was an undertone. And he was absolutely, he didn't care if you were going to make him the, you know, the Darth Vader or the, you know, the evil empire. He didn't care. He was going to make sure yeah. those kids went to class, got their diploma. Yeah. And, and he, he was going to make sure that they were going to be great men in their lives. And you can't take anything away from that. I just remember a conversation I had with Patrick Ewing after long after we retired. Yeah. And, and we had a conversation about this and, uh, and, 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 you know, he carried some of that over to his next career, you know, wouldn't sign an autograph, whatever, and, you know, it was yeah. very, you know, insulated and, uh, and, and wasn't, and he, he like almost apologized and said, you know what? I, because after he was, when he realized how much people really did like him or love him who were Nick fans, I think he kind of was sorry that he wasn't a little bit more, wasn't more of a two-way street. And I really got the feeling that he meant it. And I think, you know, that was a carryover from Georgetown. There's no question about it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, like Sonny alluded to, you know, uh, all of those guys, including Patrick, we had Patrick on and he's laughing and joking. I've never seen him like that. I know. Is that something? Interviews. Is yeah, that something? It really is. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, remember, I remember coming away from a conversation. I, you know, I also remember him um, during uh, when he was playing for the Knicks. I remember doing an interview with him off to the side. You know, it was about the Knicks and he was he was he was still a young player. And I told him the story I told you about how, you know, they thought I was rooting for the other team. And, whatever, and he said, you know, what, pal, just do your job, you know. He's really a different guy than, than, than he portrayed. I'm glad he was on with you guys because he really is. Uh, it's hard to say this word, but he is can, can be gregarious and funny. And, yeah, very wait, grounded. That's, yeah. that's the same yeah. Patrick Ewing? <laughs> yeah, well, that's what we walked away. We walked away saying that every time we had a Georgetown guy on, you yeah. know. Yeah. It was yeah, it this, was wild. Not, you know, not long after they asked him for his ID in the Madison Square Garden, he was like pointing at his his, his <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, can you imagine that? That was hey, I I was doing a game at the Carrier Dome. Um, I want to say this must have been before we got to Madison Square Garden. So I think this was in the the Big East tournament, but I think it was I, I think it was played at the Carrier Dome. It was. I'm doing, a, I'm, I'm doing a game with uh, Dave Bing, and Dave <laughs> didn't have his credential with him, and <laughs> no. the security guard wasn't going to let him in. And I went. I said. You go back and tell that security guard that if it wasn't for him, there'd be no carrier dome. <laughs> there'd be no Syracuse basketball. <laughs> Unbelievable. That, yeah, that's oh, a head scratcher. That would that for that to happen to Dave Bing and a guy like Patrick at the well, garden. Oh my goodness. Probably some young yeah. kid. I don't you know what do you know? Yeah, I yeah, I don't think it was anything intentional. Just somebody that just didn't know. No, you know? I mean someone doing their job. They had a badge and they were gonna use it. <laughs> had a badge and that's it. That's it. They had, you know. So, okay. So now you're, you're in your, your, how long were you with the Big East, Lennon? How long did, were you uh, commentating for? I never, you know, I know their first season was 79, 80. Um, and I knew my first full year at Channel 4 was 86. And there's a connection there because the reason I stopped doing the Big East games was because my boss had, when I got a full time job doing the six o'clock and then, the next year in 87, doing the 11 o'clock news, replacing Marv Albert on Channel 4, the boss was very adamant. You will not do any other acting because Marv was never there. He was always doing yeah. games, doing boxing matches, football, whatever. So the boss said, here's the deal. You're going to be the sportscaster, but you can't do anything else. It got to the point where I was invited to play myself on a sitcom uh, in L.A. I, I used to have this thing called uh, Sports Fantasy where people would – act out their favorites, you know, yeah. Yeah. we had, we had a, a guy standing in goal against Gretzky and a kid in a wheelchair played Michael Jordan and stuff like that. Then so a sitcom starring a uh, Jack Klugman, I forget the name of it. And they wanted me to come out and do an appearance because Klugman had a fantasy at the racetrack. My boss wouldn't even let me do that. So it was like, oh, uh, really? I'm just doing this. So that's how I remember with Trent Gacy and Gavin, I said, guys, you know, I'd love to do the Big East the rest of my life. In retrospect though, I really got the best years of the Big East. I mean, no yeah. offense to whatever happened to the Big East or whatever they're doing now, but my goodness, as I mentioned before, those guys going head to head four years, Chris Bowl. Yeah. You know, hey, I mean, Lynn, yeah. I'm an 85 grad, Chuck's an 86 grad. So we're going to say absolutely was the best. <laughs> <year>. <laughs> no, those were, hey, that 85 year with Villanova. I mean, you had three teams and Memphis State in the final four. I was almost tempted to get an airplane to fly down. It was just unbelievable. I, yeah. I knew Georgetown was going to take care of St. John's because they've already beaten them three times that year, twice in the regular season, once in the Big East tournament. Uh, the Villanova thing was such a shocker. But, of course, I don't have to tell you, Mr. Villanova, that was the last game in the history of college basketball that didn't have a shot clock. So that I'm not helped. Sure. Believe I'm me, not that sure. helped. Yeah, I think that had a little something to do with the uh, yeah. slowing things down in the second half. Sure. Yeah. We, they, let us, they let us hold the ball. In fact, we, you know, when we talked to Patrick, you know, they actually held the ball, you know, and uh, that was not normal for those guys. They right. would just attack, attack, attack. All oh, the time, it was unbelievable. You know? I was actually, I was in a motel room in Florida. I think I went to cover spring training and I'm lying there all by myself in this. It wasn't a very nice, and I'm screaming. I mean, I, it, it, people, you know, people are oh, the great Villanova. Let me tell you something. That's, it felt like it was a million to one. It really did. And what was Villanova's record? The regular what was your record in regular season? It was barely a winning we, record, right? We were 19 and 10. Okay. So you lost 10 games. Yeah, and you didn't win 20 lost. games, which is, used to be the threshold. Yeah, and that used to be the number. Yeah, that was the magic number to get in the tournament. So we weren't sure if we were even going to get in, you know. Yeah, it was it was I remember yelling. I, I thought it was one of the great, great college basketball things I had ever seen. I, I was just and I was excited because I loved Raleigh. You know, Raleigh, it was method to his madness when he invited you over for pizza. I was a Raleigh Massimino fan the rest of my life. My God, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard when you know when you get in the game and you got five guys in the zone all at the same time, Len. And that's that's basically what happened. We went nine for ten in the second half. So that you know. I know, I know. You had the, you played a you played a perfect half, right? And your free throws, yeah. you made them all, right? Pretty much. Yeah. To, Len, I have to thank you because Daryl and, and Chico they found a little clip of a. Uh, I have to thank you because you were calling a game. We were playing Georgetown at Georgetown. I think we we're losing by double digits because obviously I was going in the game. So I think we were getting killed. Was this at uh, Landover or yeah, there? Yeah, it, was at, it was at the Cap Center. Yeah. Oh, the Cap and, Center. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you uh, 
You were very nice, and we have it on a little video where you called the game, and I have to appreciate you not yawning or falling asleep at that point in the game, at least sticking it out and being nice. Well, I had to say to the end there, I wouldn't get paid. So it was <laughs> method to my madness. Oh, there, there goes the balloon. You just popped the balloon. <laughs> Those clips are great. I, I'll tell you I'll tell you a funny story. I, maybe, maybe, maybe you think I'm an idiot. But, you know, when ESPN did the whole 30 for 30, yes. on, uh, the Big East, they had called me up and said, hey, Len, we're doing this whole thing on the Big East. I said, oh, great. I love the Big East. It was a big deal to me. And uh, they said, what we want you to do, as we, I, you must have a lot of tapes. I said, yeah, I do have a bunch of tapes. He said, we'd like you to go through all your tapes and, and let us know exactly what you have and, uh, you know, dub some things off for us. And then at some point, we'll do an interview. And I said, oh, so, oh, so you want me to do all this stuff right now? And you're going to pay me what? And they said, oh, no, we don't. And so that's why you see Mike Gorman being interviewed throughout the 30 for 30. You know, but that, they were nice enough to use some of my clips. I will tell you, let me tell you one. Other, I don't know if we're running out of time or not, but let me oh, tell you. Fine. Let me tell you one other story that really, <laughs> to me, crystallized a Dave Gabbett and Mike Tringisi. Uh, no better people to work for. Uh, no nicer people. I remember we were driving to Landover. Uh, for a game, and um, it was early. And that, that, did Georgetown play there in the first years? Of the, they must have. I, yeah, they I played, was a college student. Yeah. I, I did a game at McDonough Gym. We, so put, we played there all four years. So, okay. yeah. So, in the beginning, they, so we were driving there, and all of a sudden, Trangisi, I'm in the back seat. Trangisi's driving with Gavin. Never forget this. She said, you know, Len, you don't have to, you don't have to sell the conference. You don't have to, you don't have to say how great the conference is. I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, you just 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 you should just call the games. You don't have to say it's a great conference. These are great games. I, I didn't didn't know that was my style anyway to do something. Listen, I, I had worked for Red Auerbach as the voice of the Boston Celtics. You had to sell wristbands. You had to sell everything into the kit because the Celtics didn't sell out in those days. I mean, wow. you're not gonna believe this. I mean, I would do a Celtics game and it'd be five thousand people at, at Boston Garden. I mean, it wasn't wow. it wasn't. I mean, it, people don't realize it. It was a hockey town. You know, this was right in the Orr and Esposito years. And and you had a sell. If you didn't sell our backs, ah, oh, you got to come to the game Saturday. You get a free wristband. So I guess I carried that over. In my, and Mike said, you don't have to, don't do any of that. Just, and that just blew me away because I can't tell you, I'll bet you every major league team in whatever the sport is, they want you to sell. So you got to sell tickets. You got to sell, you know, uh, back day, uh, mug night, whatever. And they were great that way. Don't sell anything which I thought was the greatest thing that would ever happen to an announcer. And, and on top of that, to have all these great teams and great coaches and great games, just call the game, have a good time. And they had such vision for the conference. It's amazing. It really did. Is that amazing? And then it makes oh, you yeah. wonder why didn't that exist before then? You had the biggest TV markets in yeah, Philly and Boston and New York and the state of Connecticut. It's and, funny, the know. story of how it actually, the genesis of it, what they, the timing of it had to be just right, and and that's where it came out from. You had I forget you had to sign like you know Trangisi said three years. There were some contract. other teams they wanted, right? I mean, did they want yeah, to get Holy Holy Cross. Cross are there? Holy, Holy Cross, Cross right? Yeah. So there were other. It wasn't. This wasn't. In fact, they started with seven teams, and then they added yeah, Pittsburgh yeah. afterwards. I remember. Yeah, you can, yeah, UConn was not part of the original plan. It was Holy Cross. Is that something? And yeah. then UConn, of course, later years, UConn and Seton Hall became major powers. But back exactly. in the day that we remember, it was uh, Syracuse, St. John's, Georgetown, and Villanova. Yeah. You know, Dave Gabbett was way ahead of his time, too, Len. I mean, he, he, he had a vision and just he, – he came out and told Mike we're going to, you know, Providence and Hartford and Syracuse and yeah. the Garden. Syracuse. So that's what I said, Syracuse. Yeah. No? All right. <laughs> no, not at all. He's still shaking his head. <laughs> Listen, you don't know how much I appreciate that, Len. As oh, a you know, professional child breaker myself, I you're love, I love the fact that you <laughs> Oh, you're pissed. You said, who's not, this whippersnapper? He I comes on my show him. and he's telling me how to talk. You're upset. No, I can tell. not at all. Are you kidding? <laughs> if it was Dick Vitale, I might get upset, but it's Len Berman. I'm okay with that, you know? Hey, Raftery does that. Every so often you'll hear him throw it a yeah. Yeah. Raftery has done that to me on more than one occasion. I've been out with him. I know all about Raftery, yeah. you know? <laughs> so 
T- talk to us about what was some of the more memorable games that you called uh, in the in, in the Big East tournament and uh, and things of that nature. I mean, the, the, the garden was like electric yeah. back then during that gonna, time. If right? you're going to ask, it was all a blur. I, I have to tell you, I think St. John's winning was 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 one yeah. huge one, and was that with Billy Goodwin on top of the basket? You mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that mm-hmm. was huge. The games at the dome. I just remember. We, Brafter and I, and the, uh, you know, I mentioned the one where Syracuse lost, but there was one where they won, and, and he and I are doing the game, and the fans are crushing us because they had all run on the court, and we're, like, yeah. standing there trying to go like this at the end and do our intelligent commentary. Um, but other than that, there, there are a lot of uh, – it's all kind of a bl- – I have to tell you, I, I, I wish I could give you – you know, pl- and there are people who can do that. I'm unfortunately I'm not one of them who could, you know, has that photographic memory. But uh, I just remember the games are great. I just remember I would come back. I was not working full time at uh, Channel Four at the time. I was working for the network. I wasn't working for the local station. And I remember running into Marv Albert, who I would fill in for occasionally. He said, "Man, those games are great." God, it was almost like a, a touch of jealousy in his voice that we had those Monday night games because they were special and because ESPN was just getting going. I mean, this was the only game in town. There weren't 17. You know, people now say, well, it's another college basketball game. There's 17 games on any given on on ESPN Plus, ESPN Deporte, whatever. But in those days, there was just this one game on a right. Monday night. And it was really mad. It was so special. I actually, uh, I, when I was working for NBC Sports, I hosted Super Bowl 17. That's how old I am. And uh, I was the, uh, the uh, pregame host. In Pasadena, this was the Super Bowl with Washington and Miami. Uh, Washington won. I took the red eye back so I could do the Villanova game at uh, at uh, the Palestra. The ne- oh. I figured they were playing, uh, Chuck. But I, I, that's how much the games were important, that I forget the Super Bowl. I took the red eye back to do the, the Villanova game the next wow. night at the Palestra. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah, they were great. great. So talk about, talk about your transition now from the Big East – into into NBC and, and what you were doing there. Yeah. How did that how did that all go down? Well, I was first working at NBC Sports. I had been the, the weekend sportscaster at Channel Two. So I remember um I they would let me go do the Monday night games. And in fact, there was one night I actually did my sports cast from a Villanova Georgetown game and had Eddie Pinckney as my live guest because uh, Eddie was from the Bronx. And the weatherman on uh, Channel 2 at the time was this guy, Mr. G, Irv Joukowsky. Mr. G. Mr. And Irv G. would tell me all the time about he, how he and Eddie, and they were friends. So I had it all set up. So I had picked me on the show, and I said, Eddie, your friend Mr. G. And Eddie said, who? You know, so it, was, it, was all, it was all set up. But so I was at Channel 2. I went over to NBC Sports to do football. I replaced Brian Gumble on the pregame show. I did that for a couple of years, and the baseball pregame one year. And then I went full time to Channel Four News. So then I was at Channel Four News, and then I was on Today's Show once a month with my goofy uh, spending the world highlights. And that went from 1986 right until 2009. And I was basically retired. And this guy calls me out of the blue, much like Trangisi did, and he said, uh, "Would you like to host a radio talk show?" I said, "Oh, we can do a sports show." He said, "No, no, no, it's a news show." I said, "Well, wait a second. I've been a sportscaster my whole life." And he said, "No, no, no, I." I've seen you on Live at Five, and I've seen you. Uh, he actually was from the Boston area. He used to watch me in Boston. He said, I know you can talk about other things. So I auditioned and got a job, and it's, it's politics. I mean, you think sports fans are nuts. You ever try to talk <laughs> to people who uh, – maybe you stop talking to some of them. Yeah, some relatives who exactly. have a different political view from you. I mean, people are nuts. I'm telling you, people are. <laughs> and I'm with the masks now and the vaccine mandate. And I have Kyrie Irving. I mean, the world is crazy. And you have the Me Too movement with John Gruden. And I mean, the world is nuts. Absolutely. The world is crazy. I, it was right. so much simpler back then when we did college basketball games. You know, it was fun. Let me I'll, ask I'll, you that, Let me ask you about one question going back yeah. to the Big East. Uh, you were in a lot of different arenas. Right. right. So you remember the dome, you remember uh, the cap center and the palestra. Yeah. How about like, do you have any memories of like the, the, the Boston college, oh, sure, their, sure. their facility or Pitt's facility? I oh, remember sure. those places, tough places to play. Yeah. They were tough because they were like uh, gyms. Uh, yeah. I just remember Pittsburgh because the lady who worked in the office was just such a, I forget her name. God love her. She was so nice and would always come over and give us treats and whatever in Pittsburgh, Boston college, actually has a, has a sad memory for me because um, 
that the games are uh, mostly you know, eventually played at Boston Garden, but back in the day they played at, uh, yeah. at Chestnut Hill in the gym. And I remember my uh, my late father-in-law had passed away, and there I was. I was sitting there doing a game, and I, I this sounds strange, and I don't think I've ever told the story. And I'm saying to myself, well, "What am I doing here?" I mean, it's like I, my wow. mind was in the game. I'm, I was thinking of my my late my late father-in-law, mm-hmm. and then ironically. Another memory is I was going to do a Monday night game. This one was a Boston Garden. I don't know who Boston was playing. And that was the day the Challenger blew up. Oh, wow. Monday night game on, on ESPN. And remember Krista McAuliffe, yes. uh, the school the teacher, teacher, teacher from yeah. nearby New Hampshire. So yep. we actually opened the broadcast on, on ESPN with me just standing in center court, center court Boston Garden and said, you know, this this happened today. We were all just so sad and, and, and devastated by it. We're going to play a basketball game. We'll take our minds off it for a couple of hours. Hope you'll join us for the broadcast. I mean, that's how we opened the broadcast. So, I mean, so those, those are a couple of Boston college memories, but those gyms, Hey, I remember Walsh gym. There was a guy, yeah. there was a guy at the the hall and, and he was known as the, uh, he wore a, uh, like a, like a mask, like he was a robber and he was known as the un, unknown trombone player. They did, you know, he had a, that's a goofy stuff. And I was the guy. I mean, I was, that was Walsh Jib, but it was, those gyms were fun, you know? Um, you know, they had big favorite. arenas, you know, everybody played in big arenas, you know, if you're going to, you know, do a Villanova game, then it was the Palestra, you know, that was, it was no longer, uh, I'm sorry, it was going to be um, uh, the Spectrum. It was no Spectrum longer, time. no longer going to be the Palestra. Right. You know, which I loved. I, I called college basketball games in the Palestra several times as a student at Syracuse. LaSalle or Temple or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Plus hey, you, fun. you mentioned something too, that I wanted to touch on, you know, with the world that we have now with TikTok and Instagram, oh, yeah. you're the first guy, you're the innovator of the, all of those different crazy clips on spanning the world. How, how did that get started? Len? Well, that, the spanning the world, I was not the first one to do a uh, plays of the month because everyone was doing a plays of the month. Uh, Marv Albert did something called the Albert Achievement Awards, and uh, right. Warner Wolf, who was at CBS. Warner Wolf, yeah. I now have him on my radio show once a week. He's a still a hoot. Do yeah, uh, he was great. He, he had his plays of the month, and George Michael Sports Machine. He did George a, Michael plays Sports of the month. Machine. Yeah. yeah. I just amazing. decided I want to do something a little bit different. You know, it wasn't just going to be uh, just straight bloopers. It, I was going to you know, either in the writing, I was going to try to make it a little bit different. And the, the whole idea of calling it Spanning the World was an inside joke because uh, ABC's Wide World of Sports, their opening was Spanning the Globe to, yes. make, to bring you the right. info. So I said, well, they're going to spl- span the globe. We're going to span somewhere else. So we called it Spanning the World just as a joke. And I hired the great voice of Don Pardo, who was doing Saturday Night Oh, Saturday Night Live. Don <laughs> we came down and did uh, the voiceover. He said, it's, it's Spanning the World, if there is a next time. And unbeknownst to me, every three months, he got a check. So he loved, he thought Spanning the World was the greatest thing that ever happened because he got a check every, every uh, uh, three months for doing that. But so we had fun with it. And that was just a fun thing. But I don't, I don't take credit uh, for it. But um, it was, we did try to make it just a little bit different. And the other bit was that we came up with the phrase, and Al Roker w- w- used to sit next to me on the local news on Channel 4. And we used to, if someone got hurt, we would say, and nobody got hurt because we didn't want to, we didn't think it was funny if a guy skis off a cliff in Liechtenstein and then we go, ha, ha, ha. So we would say, and nobody got hurt. Now, there were times we had no idea if the person was hurt or not because we weren't going to call the, the hospital in Liechtenstein. So we just did the journalistic, uh, uh, th- uh, prudent thing and we just lied. You know, we just said, no, well, nobody got hurt. Well, you know, you know what's true though is is you uh, you put some some decency and some heart into all the things that you've done, and you, it it just comes through. You can tell. We need more people like you in the profession. So, well, I I appreciate Thank that. I, I know the world is nuts. It really, and you should. I mean, it's not everybody, but you should see some of the emails and some of the phone calls I get. I mean, if it, you know people who actually the and I don't whatever anyone's political beliefs are, it's fine. That's why they make vanilla and yeah. chocolate. But the radio station I work for is a very conservative radio station. In fact, that was the station that Rush Limbaugh was on and still has Sean Hannity. I'm the only voice between 5 a.m. and 9 p.m. that doesn't lean right. I lean wow. left. And you can only imagine how much the audience just loves me. Oh, they're probably frosted. <laughs> <laughs> how are you dealing with that? Getting well, I, I, phone calls and all that. Well, now with a sense of humor. In, in the beginning, yeah. it would bother me a lot. 
But now I realize it's just, it's radio shtick. Now, there's a small percentage of listeners who aren't crazy. And they will write me and constantly, and how could you say this? Because Obama was worse. And how could you say that Trump wanted to uh, make America white again? Because everyone knows Obama hated. I mean, but there are other listeners who are great. Uh, there's a truck driver who calls from Atlanta and he beeps his horn on the air and he just gives me a hard time. And he, I, it's good natured. You know, there's another, tr actually, another truck driver in Connecticut, he would call up and say, Lan, you're making me drive off the road today. And, uh, but, but the ones who are good natured, I love, I mean, that's fine. You know, you're allowed yeah. to have friendly banter. I'm not saying everyone has to be right or left or in the middle or anything. I'm mean, just say what you feel, but, but respect the other guy's opinion and, uh, and, and handle it with some camaraderie. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's what it's all about, man. I mean, whatever happened to that, you and I can have a difference of opinion. Yeah, that's what's been know. lost. Yeah. It, it really has. And yeah. you know, I used to think it was tough in sports, but listen, Remember the Subway Series when the Yankees would play the Mets? You'd have people in the sure. same family. You'd have a Mets fan sitting next to a Yankee fan. Come yeah. on. We all got along. We all, yeah. It was great. But, yeah. You know, does everything have to be life and death? I just don't know if we'll ever get back to a, a civil conversation. I hope we do. This conversation has been pretty civil, except when Chuck screwed up how to pronounce Syracuse. Syracuse. Uh, yes. I said it. I think it's been pretty civil. <laughs> That's great. And I'm telling you, you feel my you feel my pain. I, that's yeah, just, I do, Sonny. I don't know how you put up with this. I really I've been don't. carrying this when, burden and for a long as you time. said, he's a big Met fan. I'm a big Yankee fan. Oh, there you go. Still, you know, he's yeah. a point guard. I'm a big. So we go back and forth. Well, my condolences to both of you. I mean, I grew up a Yankee fan. I was <laughs> I a know big, Mickey, big Mickey Mantle fan. I mean, that, he was my yeah. idol. I could tell you Mantle stories. But um, uh, um, but the Mets just seem to be star-crossed, as are the Jets. And uh yeah. And the Yankees yeah. have spent all the money in the world. And if Steinberg were alive today, he'd blow it all up. So, yep, he would. Well, yeah. one last question for you, Len, and we'll let you yeah. go. If you had, if you had a youngster that was trying to get into the business, what, right. what's the word of advice that you would give him? Well, I, uh, I, I tell you, and I do uh, hear from young people all the time, and I'm happy to answer their questions and stuff. I think you have to be flexible. It's much like, uh, you know, you tell a young kid who's playing peewee football, don't, you know, you're not a right guard for the rest of your life. You know, don't lock yourself in. And the same thing, be flexible. I felt I was pretty flexible because I, when I left Syracuse and I grew up in New York, I went to Dayton, Ohio, and I worked as a newsman uh, at a TV station. So I wasn't sports and I didn't stay home. You got to be flexible. And, and I say, get an internship. If you're in college, get an internship at a local television station, invariably, those internships turned into, listen, Jeff Zucker, who runs CNN, started as a page at NBC, as did Regis Philbin. I mean, everyone starts somewhere. And I started as an intern in Dayton, Ohio. And you have to be flexible. You have to do whatever comes up and, and always be there. Because at some point, if you're in a newsroom somewhere, someone's going to say, hey, kid, can you do this? And the answer is always yes. Yeah, I can go do that. Even if you don't know what the hell they're asking you to do. I mean, that, that, that's be flexible, be attentive, show up and... Uh, and try to weasel your way in, no matter how you can do it. Don't you're not going to start as the play-by-play -play man of the Syracuse Orange Man. It doesn't that's not how it begins. So, so one one more before yeah. before I let you before we let you go, Len. What what school did you go to? Just how do you say? Uh, Syracuse. Come on, the Sar and Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say we want to thank our Syracuse graduate. Yeah, that's two me. Syracuse superstars. Thanks, guys. Len Berman, the great Len Berman. Hey, Len, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. I enjoyed I it. I hope you had fun too. I hope thank you have you very uh, much. I hope the editing isn't too tough because there's a lot of <laughs> crap in there. <laughs> no, it's all good. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, all right, pal. guys. Good Thanks, luck. Len. Nice meeting you. Nice You've been listening you to the Big East Rewind with Chuck Everson and Sonny Spira. The Big East Rewind is produced and directed by Daryl Gurney and Nick Chico Chorus. You could reach us on gmail if you have any questions uh, concerns comments or anything on the show at uh, big east rewind at gmail.com and of course uh, on youtube at big east rewind thanks a lot for joining us and have a great day thank you <laughs>